you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15, we'll be looking at verses 16 to 32. And as you've no doubt heard, like Tony, allergies have gotten the best of me this week, so, so bear with me. Lord willing, my voice will hold up as we make our way through Mark 15. As you turn there, let me go ahead and pray for us as we prepare to hear God's word. Would you tell us in your word, how can they believe in him whom they have never heard? How can we hear without a preacher? For faith comes by hearing and hearing through the words of Christ. And, and that's what we need to hear this morning as we come to your word. We need to not merely hear about Christ. We need to hear Christ himself proclaim himself to us through his word. And so we pray, Lord, that, that you would speak in this time. Lord, we pray that you would make not only the hearing of your word, not only the reading of your word, but the preaching of your word, an effective means to, to convince and to convert and to build your people up into knowledge and righteousness and holiness unto faith and salvation. And so we pray, Lord, that you would use that to grow us and strengthen us. We pray as your word goes forth that you would keep your promise as you always do, that your word would not go out and return to you empty, but would accomplish the purposes for which you send it out, and that you would use your word in a mighty and powerful way this morning as we hear it. And so we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you're able, let me invite you to please stand as we honor the reading of God's word from Mark 15, beginning in verse 16. And this is God's word. So take care how you hear it. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. This is God's word. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our God stands forever. You may be seated. <clears throat> Well, one of my favorite hymns of all time is a, is a hymn called The Sands of Time Are Sinking. It's a, a hymn written by Anne Cousin, and she pieces it together by taking lines out of the letters from Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford was one of the Scottish commissioners to the Westminster Assembly, and he, he wrote these letters as he was exiled uh, away from his church, forbidden to preach, and he was writing letters to his congregation and many colleagues in ministry and many friends. And one of the themes that runs through these letters is the beauty and glory of Christ. And you hear this come out in the hymn as he, they speak of the king there in his beauty without a veil is seen. It were a well-spent journey, though seven deaths lay between. The lamb in his fair army does on Mount Zion stand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land, speaking of the glory we'll see of Christ in heaven, speaking of how, how we'll long to behold him, he says, the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. 
I will not gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. Not on the crown he gifteth, but on his pierced hands. The lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. He speaks of the beauty and glory of Christ. And I had that, song, that, that hymn in my mind this week because our passage this morning holds out for us the beauty and the glory of Christ. And yet what we find as we read through this passage is that many don't have eyes to see it. It's there for us to see if only we have eyes to see the beauty and glory of Christ held out to us. And that's the lesson for us from this passage. We must see the kingly glory of Christ in the offense of the cross. And so I just want to walk through this passage under two headings. We'll see first what most fail to see, and then we'll see what we must see. Look with me at what most fail to see. Remember, Jesus has been repeatedly declared innocent in his trials before Pilate. And yet, though he's innocent, he's delivered over to die. And not just to die, to be crucified. And he's been scourged. And now he's led away by the soldiers into the governor's headquarters. And as they get him there, they begin to mock him. They begin to mock him as a king. He's been called the king of the Jews. And they they begin to give him all this false homage in mockery as if he was a king dressing him in in a purple robe. And and some say it's a scarlet robe. It's probably so faded. It's an old Roman soldier's robe. And it's somewhere in that family of purple to scarlet. But it's faded to the point you can't really tell anymore what color it used to be. And he's draped with this robe, and they twist together a crown of thorns and press it down upon his skull. One commentary brings out the point that that he's bearing the curse that comes through Adam. One of the things that Adam is told after he sins is that now the ground will yield thorns and thistles because of his sin. And here, as Jesus is going to the cross to make an end to the curse, he's bearing the curse and having the thorns put upon his head. They bring him into this palace. They robe him with this robe, put a crown of thorns upon him. They give him a reed to hold in his hand as if it was a scepter. And then they line up and begin to mock him. They bow down before him and pretend to worship him. Hail, king of the Jews. And as they stand up, they take the reed out of his hand and strike him over the head with it and spit in his face. Mocking him. As a king, it's deep humiliation, deep shame and degradation that Jesus is feeling here and being exposed to here. And it doesn't end. We'll see that theme run throughout the whole passage of the shame which Christ bears and endures as he goes to the cross. And after they're done making a mockery of him, they they take off all this false kingly attire, put his own clothes back on him and lead him out to be crucified. And one of the things about crucifixion is that it was, it was done in a way that was meant to be a public spectacle. That every part from start to finish was meant to make a show of you, to shame you and degrade you in, the most, uh, in any way possible. So that others would be deterred from doing whatever it was that you did to earn the death of crucifixion. And so that would start as you are there to bear your own cross and carry it to the place of your execution. And Jesus starts off carrying his own cross, but because he's been scourged and beaten, he's so weak that he's not able to carry it very far. And so a man is enlisted to now come and help carry the cross for him. Man, we're told Simon of Cyrene. He's from somewhere there in in the region of modern day Libya, and he's coming to Jerusalem. And he's he's seems to be walking in and he's just pulled out from the crowd and told that he's going to carry the cross of Christ for him. And Mark gives us a really interesting detail about this man, Simon, that that other uh, evangelists don't give. He says that this man was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, that might seem like an odd detail until you remember that Mark is there in Rome with Peter, as far as we understand, writing to Romans about who Jesus is as the Son of God. And Rufus's name shows up in Paul's letter to the Romans. There, the very end, chapter 16, Paul says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. And I think we're meant to see there, most scholars seem to to suggest that this is the same Rufus who is the son of Simon of Cyrene, the man who carried the cross of Christ. And that would, if, if that's right, that would explain why Paul goes out of his way to mention his name when he's writing in a Roman context of this man. This man, you know, he was there. He can, he, his father was there. He can tell you what it was like for his father to carry the cross and the stories he heard. 
And that's one interesting observation for us because it raises the question, was this the day and the moment when Simon was converted? Or maybe was it later on in life in the weeks and months that followed as he reflected on, on this experience of carrying the cross of Christ. The evidence is that his family came to be followers of Christ. Not only Rufus is part of the church, but Rufus's mother, Simon's wife, has been a mother to Paul as well as they're serving in the church and ministering. Whatever it was, whether it happened in this moment or whether it was later as he reflected on it, one of the interesting and beautiful things we see is that Simon and his family somehow managed to see something that nearly everyone else misses. They see something of the beauty and the glory of Christ as he's walking the road to the cross, something that everyone else misses as they mock him. He carries the cross for Jesus and they lead him out to a place called Golgotha, a place of a skull. That's where they're going to crucify him. And as they bring him there, we're told they offer him wine mixed with myrrh. On one level, this is a fulfillment of Psalm 69. And we'll see all the way throughout this passage ways that Mark is alluding to the Old Testament to tell us that everything that happens along the way is a fulfillment of the scriptures. And so this fulfills Psalm 69. They gave me poison for my food and for my thirst. They gave me sour wine to drink. (laughs) Most suggest that this wine that's mixed with myrrh is actually some sort of a drugged wine. It's there given before crucifixion takes place to somehow desensitize and deaden some of the pain of the process of crucifixion to help someone endure it. And so it's significant that when Jesus is offered this drink, he refuses it. He will not take the easy way out. He will not lessen the experience of the cross In any way, he's going to endure to the fullest what it means to die in our place for our sins, to bear God's wrath. And he's going to endure the physical pain and torments of the cross as well. There is no drop of blood that fell from him that he did not feel. He did not deaden the pain of this experience or take any kind of drugs to make it easier. And it's significant to see him go through. He's able to save to the uttermost because he endured to the uttermost the suffering of the cross on our behalf. He felt every moment of it. Mark tells us, then they crucified him. And William William Hendrickson in his commentary says that, that Mark tells us that with such simplicity, we're almost tempted to overlook what happens. He says three words, they crucified him. But think about what happens to him as he's being crucified. It was a horrific way to die. You would be stripped naked to add shame to the whole process, that you would be exposed for all the world to see. And you're nailed to the cross, nailed through your hands and feet to this piece of wood. And and there's a small platform on which you stand. And because of the, the position in which your arms are held up, it's difficult to breathe. And so you need to push yourself up to be able to take a full breath. And then it's exhausting and painful. So you sink back down and you continue that process until you're so exhausted that you can no longer push yourself up and you slowly suffocate to death on the cross. And this process could take days at times to be carried out. And all the while, it's being carried out as a public spectacle to shame and degrade the one who is dying in such a horrific way. Some suggest that that crucifixions were always carried out at some sort of public road or, or, or intersection so that people would pass by and add mockery and insult to the whole process. And you see that in, in Jesus' own death as those who pass by join in in mocking him. He's, he's subjected to this horrific death, this shameful death, and yet we do have to remind ourselves, as we've emphasized throughout this series on on Christ's suffering, that his physical suffering pales in comparison to his spiritual suffering. We'll touch on this more next week, but he's he's there bearing our God's wrath in our place. He's, He's not only suffering the physical death of the cross, not only suffering the shame associated with this death, but he is bearing the wrath of God in place of sinners. It's an unbearable burden that is placed upon him. It makes his crucifixion far more painful and difficult than anyone else's would have been because he's bearing the wrath of God in place of his people. And as he's hanging there on the cross, they begin to cast lots for his clothing. And that, again, is a reminder that this is uh, fulfilling prophecy because this comes right out of Psalm 22. 
we, we read Psalm 22 in Sunday school this morning, and I had to not make any comments because I was going to talk about it all in here this morning. But Psalm 22 is being fulfilled throughout this whole process of the crucifixion, and, and Mark wants you to see that in the various ways he references things in the passage. He talks about how, how the mockery of Christ is something that's fulfilled from Psalm 22. He says there in Psalm 22, verses 6 through 8, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. The mockery is a fulfillment of Psalm 22, but even the process of crucifixion fulfills Psalm 22 as well. We see a couple verses down, starting in verse 16. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. All of this is fulfilling the Old Testament. Jesus is, is being led all over the place. He's led by the soldiers everywhere he goes. He's led to the cross, and yet he's ultimately led by the hand of God as he's going out, carrying out in obedience to the Father, everything that was planned for him to do. All of it, all along the way, is a fulfillment of the scriptures, happening exactly as it was written in every detail. It's the third hour when they crucified him based on the, the Jewish way of accounting time. That's essentially 9 a.m., we're told. And that makes sense because the, the Sanhedrin got the ball rolling as soon as the sun came up. And they've rushed this process along all the way. And so by 9 a.m., they're, they're already at the point that they crucify him. And Pilate has a charge nailed to the top of the cross to stipulate the reason for his death. That he's the king of the Jews. And he's crucified there, not alone, but we're told that there are robbers, thieves that are crucified on either side of him, one on his right and one on his left. And, and some have even made the point that Jesus is crucified in the middle as if he's the leader, as if he's the worst of them all. He's there crucified among these common criminals. And this, again, is an important fulfillment of the Old Testament because it references Isaiah 53, that in his death he was numbered with the transgressors. He's numbered among them. He's, as far as they could see, he was just another criminal from their perspective. He's numbered there with one criminal on his right and one on his left, numbered with the transgressors. And that does raise an important point for us to consider as we think about all that Christ endured for us on the cross. It's important to remember that he, he bore the wrath of God, but he bore not only the wrath of God, but he bore the shame and, for our sin. Not only the guilt for our sin, but the shame of it. In his death, he was treated like a sinner. He was treated as if he had sinned. The people that were crucifying him, all that were there involved in putting him to death, viewed him as a sinner. They saw him as, as one who was unworthy to live and treated him as if he was a sinner. And yet he never sinned. He had never done anything wrong. He had no shame to feel. You, you and I know that we feel shame when we sin. We do something wrong and we feel that we are wrong. Jesus never felt that. We're told of, of Adam and Eve in the garden. They were created. They were naked and unashamed. Not just that they didn't wear clothes, but they were able to bear their souls to one another without any, any fear of rejection or, or shame or anything to come. And that's a picture of how Christ lived before his father. There, there's no shame there. There's nothing to hide from. He had no skeletons in his closet. He had no deep, dark secrets that he was worried about people discovering. He had no shame. And yet here he stands in our place bearing all of the guilt and all of the shame of our sin, treated as a sinner numbered among the transgressors. Isn't it astounding that Christ never sinned and yet because of what he endured on the cross, he never sinned and yet he knows what it feels like to be a sinner. Because he was numbered with the transgressors and all begin to mock him for it as they pass by. The bypassers come and ridicule him and say, he who said, tear down the temple in three days and I will rebuild it. Why don't you save yourself? And of course, we looked at that passage a few weeks ago. They, they misinterpret him. They misquote him. Because that passage is, is Jesus prophesying about his own death and resurrection. And here he is in the midst of fulfilling it. 
And it will be brought to completion in three days when he rises from the dead. And yet they're mocking him with this same charge that the false witnesses brought before him in his trial. But it's not just them. The priests and the scribes mock him to each other. Hear what they say. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Don't pass over that without realizing how, how evil that is in the way that they mock him. They, they acknowledge that he saved others. They acknowledge the miracles that he's done, the work that he's done throughout his ministry. They acknowledge that, that he's cast out demons. They were there when he spoke to the paralytic and said, your sins are forgiven, rise and walk. They were there when he healed the man's withered hand. They, they, they heard about him cast out other demons and give sight to the blind, give hearing to the deaf, to loose the tongues of those who were mute. They, they saw him do all of these mighty works. They even understood and recognized that he had raised the dead. No one disputed that Lazarus had died and now was alive again. In fact, it's because Lazarus was raised from the dead that they wanted to kill him all the more. They saw all that he had done, and yet they still will not believe. And as they mock him, they act and pretend as if he would only do this one more sign, then they would see and believe. It's not true. Friends, that's an important point for you to come to grips with this morning. Because if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, and, and the reason that you give to yourself and to others is that you just don't have enough evidence. If only Jesus would give you a little bit more evidence, then you would believe. No, that's not the case, friends. The reason that you don't believe in Christ is not because he has not proven himself to you. It's not because you don't have enough evidence. It's because you have a heart that is dead in sin. It's because you have a heart of stone and you cannot believe unless he comes and takes out the heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh. Unless he breathes upon you in the way that he breathed upon Adam and he became a living being. Unless he breathes upon you and you're born again, you cannot believe in him. No matter what you see, no matter what evidence he's giving to you, he's already proven himself in such a way that all are without excuse. His eternal power and divine nature have been revealed in the things he has made and in the way that he governs the world. We all are without excuse, but you cannot believe unless he gives you eyes to see. These priests and these scribes, they saw his miracles. They didn't deny what he did, and rather than believe in him, it only made them hate him all the more. No, friends, don't, don't stand over God and ask him to give you more proof of who he is. Humble yourself and come before him and ask him to give you eyes to see. Ask him to give you faith to believe so that you might trust in him. That's the mistake that these priests and these scribes are making here. And it's not just them. Even the robbers who are crucified with him join in in the mockery and they revile him. Did you notice that? That's, it's almost passed by in subtle detail. But even the men who are bearing the same shame of the same cross on either side of him, even they don't get mocked and derided and scorned in the way that Christ does. To the point that they can take some comfort by turning their attention to Jesus and joining in in mocking him. He's not, he's not merely numbered with the transgressors. He's mocked by the transgressors. As he, the innocent one, dies on the cross, they mock him. And of course, Luke tells us that one of them does come to see him for who he is. And Jesus promises that he, he has life in him. But the other one, as far as we know, continued to mock Christ until his dying breath. They joined in in, in mocking him and, and scorning him and reviling him. Friends, you need to see his glory was on display. They saw his glory. They saw the same things in Jesus as he's crucified as Simon of Cyrene saw. It's just that they didn't have eyes to see it as beautiful and lovely and glorious. They didn't have eyes to see who Christ is and what he is doing. And so when they saw the same thing, him high and lifted up on the cross, they despised him for it instead of loving him for it. Christ's glory was displayed. They just didn't have eyes to see it. And that raises the question for us, friends. Do, do you have eyes to see the glory and the beauty of Christ as he is here on the cross? They missed it. That's what they failed to see, but that's what we must see. There's an emphasis on this passage of Jesus being the king, the king of Israel, the king of the Jews. 
We've heard it six times already just in chapter 15 so far. And it's really interesting because Matthew in his gospel has this emphasis on Christ as king all the way through. And yet Mark here seems to save it precisely for this moment. He focuses on Jesus as king as he is on his trial and as he is nailed to the cross. James Edwards in his commentary says that Mark actually intends Jesus' trial and crucifixion to be the royal enthronement of Christ as the Messiah. And that's why he emphasizes his kingship here in this passage. So I just want to focus on three ways from this text that I think we see Christ lifted up as a glorious king. See his beauty and kingly glory of Christ in this passage. The the first is when we remember why it is that he is enduring the cross, the shame and pain and suffering of the cross. He's doing it to obey his father. Every step of the way that he takes is a step of obedience unto death, even death on the cross. He's doing it out of obedience to the Father, and he's doing it in order to save us from our sins. Because before the foundation of the world, the Father and the Son and the Spirit covenanted together that the Father would elect a particular people to redeem, and that he would send the Son to be the one who who purchased that salvation, who would be the Redeemer of his elect, who would come and suffer in our place, who would die and rise again and save his people. And that they would pour out the Spirit upon those people to apply salvation to them in their lives. He's coming and suffering in order to save us. See, that's what they they missed as they're mocking him on the cross. And they say he saved others, but he cannot save himself. And of course, that's not true. It's not that he could not save himself. It's that he would not save himself. He would not save himself. He refused to save himself so that he might save us. That's why he's there beaten and bruised and bloodied on the cross so that he might offer himself to you as the one who has satisfied God's wrath and who has redeemed you from your sins if you would only look to him and trust in him. That's why he says he's lifted up so that he might draw all people to himself. He's lifted up just as the serpent was lifted up on the pole in the wilderness as the people were being attacked by snakes and dying and they need to be saved and so lift. God tells Moses to make a bronze serpent and lift it up so that anyone who's bit by a snake and about to die can look to the serpent. And when they look in faith, they'll be healed. And Jesus says, just as that serpent was lifted up, he must be lifted up so that if you would look to him, lift it up on the cross, dead for you, you will be saved from the wrath of God. He died so that you might find life. He's stripped naked so that you could be clothed in his perfect righteousness. He's numbered with the transgressors so that you could be numbered as one of the children of God. He refused to save himself so that he might save you. And in that we see something of his beauty and his glory as our king who defeats his enemies and subdues us to himself and rules over us and protects us and defends us and saves us. We see his glory as we see what he did and accomplished for us. We second see his glory on display when we see the way that he endured such disgrace with dignity. When he suffers, he does not threaten. When he is reviled, he does not revile in return. We don't see him in this passage hurling insults back at those who mock him. We don't see him spitting back at those who spit upon him. No, he he bears it all in quiet submission to the Father, trusting himself to the one who judges justly. If he had had gotten provoked, if he allowed them to set him off and he allowed his anger to rise and lost his temper and came off the cross just to prove to them that he could, then all of our hopes of salvation would have vanished like smoke. But he doesn't. He, he remains on the cross. He endures their mockery and their derision and their scorn and the shame of the cross with quiet dignity. We even find him in some of the other gospel records praying for those who crucified him, saying, forgive them for they do not know what they do. He refused to take the drug wine to deaden the pain of crucifixion. In all of this, he, he suffers with, with regal kingly glory all the way to the bitter end. This is not an impotent, weak man as he hangs on the cross. This is a a man with amazing strength, not only physical strength to endure the physical pain and suffering 
but spiritual strength and godly character to suffer in such a dignified way. And we see his glory. Third, we see his glory as we we realize not only what his death accomplished for us, but what it accomplished for him. Because the scriptures are clear that it's his humiliation that leads to his exaltation. It's as he dies that he crushes the head of the serpent, that he defeats sin and death and Satan. It's as God has his son on the cross that he disarms the rulers and authorities and holds them out to open shame, triumphing over them in Christ. It's his death that is his exaltation to, to being king and Lord, because, of course, the cross leads to his resurrection And the resurrection leads to his ascension. And his ascension leads to his enthronement on the right hand of the Father where he is told to sit down until every last enemy is placed under his feet. He's mocked as king in this passage. And yet, friends, as we speak now, he reigns as king. And the day is coming that though he was humiliated with this robe and this crown of thorns and this this reed, and they they mocked him as they bowed before him and spit upon him. The day is coming when he's going to return in all of his exalted glory, and on that day he will be robed in dreadful majesty. There's almost an eerie similarity as you flip over to Revelation 19 between the way Christ is mocked in our passage and the way he appears in his return. In Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, John tells us, Then I saw heaven opened, And behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, friends, they they crowned him with a crown of thorns to mock him, but on that day when he returns, he will have many diadems. He will be crowned with many crowns. They, they draped him in a purple robe in order to, to deride him and shame him. But on that day, he will return on a robe that has been dipped in blood, soaked in the blood of his enemies. No longer will he be silently led to the slaughter, but he will have a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth with which to strike down his enemies. He won't have a reed placed in his hand that they'll pull out and hit him over the head with. No, he will have a rod of iron that he will use to rule the nations and crush all who oppose him. In fact, he will not be led anywhere, but we're told he will come leading the armies of heaven who will follow after him to do his bidding. There will be no sign placed above his head as king of the Jews to mock him as he dies, but he will come with a name written on his thigh and on his robe, king not just of the Jews, king of kings, lord of lords, king of all kings, ruler of the kings of the earth. And in that day, we're told that all will bow before him. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess. Even the tongues of those who gathered around to mock and spit upon him will bow down before him and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And friends, the the question that that holds out for us is, is where will you be on that day, will you be among those who, who delight and rejoice at his return and throw yourselves down willingly to bow down before him and praise him as Lord and King and who kiss the Son? Or will you be those who are forced to your knees and through gritted teeth are forced to confess that he is Lord? Because you will bow and you will confess, but you'll either bow as you worship your returning King who comes to usher you into glory, or you will bow to be confessing the one who is about to pour out his wrath upon you for all eternity. Friends, come to him. Trust in him. Don't don't be led astray by the shame of the cross, but see beyond it to see the glory of the King of kings and Lord of lords and kiss the Son. Come to him and trust in him. Friends, as you see him on the cross, you're meant to behold your king. 
You're meant to see his beauty and his loveliness. To some, it's a savor of death unto death. To some, it is foolishness and a stumbling stone. But to those who are being saved, it is the wisdom of God and the power of God. It's a savor of life unto life. And you're called to see him and see his beauty and his glory. To not be tripped up by the shame of the cross, but to so love the one who hung on the cross that you're willing to take up your own cross and follow after him, regardless of what shame and scorn you might bear along the way, knowing that you're only following after his footsteps. And if you suffer with him, you will reign with him in all of his glory. You see, friends, what, what leads some to mock and to revile him, the shame of the cross, it's the very thing that motivates our worship, isn't it? He's worthy of our worship because he is God. And yet because he is God who became man to suffer and die in our place, it's an added motive that with which we worship the Son of God. One who would love us in such a way to come and save us at such cost. And friends, you must behold him by faith now in hopes that one day you will behold him by sight in glory. See the glory of Christ displayed on the cross and worship the King. Let's pray. Father, what a glorious and beautiful thing it is that you would not spare your own son, but would give him up for us all. And not only that you would give him up, but that he would freely and willingly come and suffer at such great cost in order to redeem us. Redeem us who are so unlovely in and of ourselves. Redeem us who are his enemies, who are those who apart from him would be joining the crowd to mock and spit upon him. That it's while we were his enemies that he would come and save us in order to redeem us, in order to make us lovely in him as we're covered with his righteousness and have our sins washed away in his blood. And we, we thank you for the, the wonderful, glorious gift it is that we have salvation in Christ. And we pray that as we behold him by faith, that we would see something of his glory. And as we behold his glory, that we would be transformed from one degree of glory to the next to look more and more like our Savior, longing for the day when he returns and we see him as he is and are made like him, free from sin forever. We thank you that he was not ashamed to call us brothers, that he was not ashamed to suffer with us, but that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. We delight in him, we worship him, and pray that you would continue to help us grow in love for him. We ask this in his name. Amen.